Hi, I'm Ginny Rosenkrantz with the University of Maryland Extension. It's June and this is the perfect time of year to look at the roses that are in bloom. I'm going to introduce you to some beautiful roses, some old, old, old world roses, some from Europe, some from Asia. I'm also going to introduce you to some of the newer varieties that we've gone ahead and grown because we just can't get enough of the roses. This one right here is amazing because I can go ahead and run through this arbor and there's no thorns on it. This is Zephyr Duran. So come and join me while we talk about how to care for your roses, how to fertilize your roses, how to prune your roses, and how to enjoy the roses, and how to smell the roses. So join me for roses, coming up next right here on Pac-14. Mmm, you should always stop and smell the roses. Oh my goodness. These are all David Austin roses, so they are actually bred to have a fabulous fragrance. You know, you could go ahead and plant them just by themselves and leave them be, and they would do okay. But to get really spectacular roses, you might want to feed the roses because you're asking them to have really good roots, really good stems, really good leaves, and really good flowers. So there's a lot of different things that you can do if you want. So I have here a different row of fertilizers and uh, different nutrients right here. So right here, this is just basically 10, 10, 10. This is not something you'd ever put on your lawn, but it is a balanced fertilizer. The first 10 is nitrogen, and that's for all the green. The second 10 is phosphorus, that's for the roots. And the third 10, that's for the flowers, okay? That would be potash. So those are always beautiful. Now this one right here looks sort of like soil, but it has kind of a, uh, a fertilizer smell. And this is rose tone, and it's specifically formulated for roses. I have a bag of it, and the bag's really pretty because it always has a rose on it, or actually a lot of roses, which is kind of cool. But what this has, which makes it so good, this is a combination of uh, organic and inorganic things. Um, it has nitrogen and other different types of uh, water-soluble nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, calcium, magnesium, and wa more water-soluble magnesium. But here's where, what, what they actually have in it. Hydronized feather meal, okay, pasteurized poultry manure, bone meal, alfalfa meal, green sand, that's potash, um, humates, that's like um, compost, uh, sulfates of potash, and um, sulfate of potash magnesium. I'm sorry, green sand is, is phosphorus, not potash, phosphorus. So it has all that, but whatever, what else this has, which is really kind of cool, and this is something that's sort of new. This has been going on for generations and generations, of course, for plants, but people have just started realizing that there are different types of things in the soil, including beneficial fungi. And one of them is one that can go ahead and uh, connect up with the roots and so the beneficial fungi is called mycorrhizae and it spreads out in the soil and it connects with all the water and all the nutrients and it wraps itself around the roots of the plants, kind of like people holding hands. And then all it asks for is a little bit of sugar from the plants, which is really cool. So it is one of those uh, complementary things that they're down under the ground. You don't even notice that they're there, but they're making the rose a lot healthier. Not only does it share nutrients, they also are very, very um, beneficial in the sense that if they feel that there is a, a root rot fungi in the area, they'll actually tangle with it. I have seen some amazing photographs of these mycorrhizae fungi battling out, strangling the bad guys. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. So that's really neat. So that is a rose tone. And then this is a, a slow release fertilizer. This is Osmocote. And this is released as um, every time it gets a little bit of, of water or rain, uh, it will go ahead and release. So you have a regular 10, 10, 10, you have the organic rose tone, and then you have the osmica, which is slow release. Okay, the other thing that's really kind of cool is this is alfalfa pellets. Now most people buy this for bunnies and stuff, and notice how this is a, a garden that's been closed in so that the bunnies cannot enjoy it, so it makes it easy to put it. But this is again a slow, slow release, and also it helps fix the soil a little bit better. So adding, it's a type of adding compost to the soil. Um, this one right here is a type of lime. Lime always regulates the soil acidity. 
we on the Eastern Shore have a very, very acidic soil. And if you have oak trees and pine trees, they seem to make the soil a little bit more acidic. We do not, like they have in Pennsylvania, we don't have limestone patches, so we have to add lime. The thing to do, of course, is get a soil test to figure out what you need and add the appropriate amount of limestone. And this one right here with a pure white is a type of salts. It's uh, Epsom salts, actually. And this is, uh, it is uh, high in magnesium. Now this is, according to the rose growers, this is to help to ro the rose plant to make better, uh, what they call uh, breaks. So in other words, a way to make some more shoots coming out, more branches coming out. The more branches you have, the more foliage you'll get, which is a healthier root system for the whole rose system. But the more branches you have gives you more beautiful roses, like these gorgeous guys. So what my rose friend does is she puts them all together in a baggie, that, and you can see that this has been used quite often. Let me open it up so you all can see on the inside. And you can see that it's got the, the pellets and the uh, magnesium and the limestone and the osmocote, and there's all kinds of other things in there. And she just reuses these bags um, year after year, but she puts exactly how much she wants in it per plant and puts it in this, gets it all ready, and then when it's time to feed the roses in the springtime, she goes ahead and grabs a bag per plant and she spreads it around. And then she works it into the soil with one of these, not to hurt the, the roots or anything like that, but just to kind of get it into the soil a little bit. And uh, that way it will be absorbed quickly by the plants. And like for instance, the slow reese, it'll be absorbed as it's needed, which is really cool. And then you get these absolutely beautiful roses. Well, speaking of roses, let's go take a look at some. Mm. Oh my goodness, this is wonderful. Uh, this is an old rose, this is Munston Woods. Notice the deep, deep, dark, dark red, almost purple color in there. And there's almost shades of black in here. It's such a dark red. I think this is absolutely gorgeous. And I wanna show you also, if you look at beyond the flowers, how the foliage is so beautifully green. It's just so bright and so lovely. So this doesn't happen by accident. This is a lot of work. But on the other hand, isn't it so worthwhile? So I love this one. This can get really, really large, but by pruning it constantly when it needs it, that keeps it a little bit more compact. And as you see, it can get large. Um, but every time you prune the rose or any other plant, you're saying, come on, you can grow a little bit. And if you have only old, old wood, then the rose will kind of go, well, here's a little bit of new wood, here's a flower. Um, here's another new branch, here's a flower. By pruning it down as often as this is done, you have a lot of new branches. A lot of new branches give you lots of new leaves and gorgeous new flowers. Always a good thing. Notice how I kept my clippers with me. I want to show you with this one too. This is really cool. This is, this is pinata. Look at all the different colors in pinata. She's got uh, this beautiful orange and it starts out the bright bright yellow and then as it matures it matures to an apricot orange which is so pretty. Now this is one of the oldest ones that is in this garden. This was planted in 1993 but this was actually accepted into the rose um, in 1978. And take a look at this right up here. That is going to burst into bloom really really soon. It's like an instant bouquet. Okay, down over here, there is um, a little one called uh, Orange Mordzag, which stands for Orange Mother's Day. So it's a little teeny flower rose. Isn't that gorgeous? Tiny, delicate, but still, that would be really, really beautiful in a bouquet. I think so. And this one right here. Oh, wow. Hold a second. I have to stop and smell the roses. Oh, my goodness. This is one of the um, Austin roses or the old-fashioned roses. And let me find out really quickly which one this is. This is... Uh, the crown princess margarita it's just gorgeous now this one as you can see likes to grow up a little bit more so she's gone ahead and put a trellis so that it can grow up a little bit more the flowers are spectacular they have so many petals so when you start out first you have the buds like this and then as she opens up you have multiple petals and when this gets to be a little bit too old then this is the time to prune it out. So this one up here could probably be put out. We had some rain yesterday. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and cut it back to where you have at least five petals. So there's one, two, three, four, five. 
I'll go ahead and prune that out right there. You don't want to go ahead and prune it out any closer, like if you only have one or two petals or three or four petals. You want to make it sure it's between five and seven petals. That way, uh, the plant will have a chance to go ahead and rejuvenate itself. So that may be the old one. But what we're going to do is we're going to put it in a bucket and it'll be compost. This is one of the older roses. This is a, um, okay, let me see now. <laughs> they, have, they have the labels down here. So, Rien de Violet, which is kind of cool. This is an 1890, when I say 1890s, or 18, I'm sorry, 1860. 1860 is when it was introduced so people could buy it. Pretty cool. So, a nice, nice old rose, beautiful, beautiful violet colors. Absolutely so beautiful. Now, one thing I wanted to show you is when you're looking at roses, um, see how this one, you can see the, uh, the veins are dark green and the, the rose itself is kind of a light color. That means that it's, it was having issues and it's starting to pull in all the nutrients. Um, come on down here and you can see where it had been pruned down here and then further down you can see the very, very old part of the, uh, the stumps of the roses which are very, very thick. And these are the new ones. So the, newer, the newer branches are the ones that have more and more flowers which are really pretty. So we come over here, and this is another old one. And this is, um, okay. Rose de Rech. More of a pinky color. More of a pinky color. Lovely. One thing I think is really unusual is all the different looks of the roses. Like for instance, I was showing you the Rose de Rech, which is a, a you know, multi-petaled and just really cool. But this one right here, is very, very similar to, I guess, the more traditional roses that we have now. Um, and see how the bud is real, real tight, and yet it opens up just a little bit to show a little bit of the, of the pink in there. And then this one almost looks like a candle on fire. It's just so pretty. And when you see it opening, well, it's absolutely beautiful, but it, see how it's very, very tight? And yet, come on over here to Sentimental, and she opens up very, very loose with these beautiful, uh, anthers and uh, stigmas down there are so, so pretty. This is a good one for pollinators because the pollinators can come in here and get all the pollen from here, which is so cool. And then I want to show you another one, this one right here. Look at this. Isn't that cool? This is an earth kind rose. Now this was uh, discovered in Texas, Texas A&M, and they were working on different types of roses that if they just stuck it in the ground, would it survive? without pruning care, without fertilizer, without all the things that we do to make these roses beautiful. And this is a survivor. Now this one, because it's in this gorgeous garden, it does get pruned and it does get fertilizer. You can tell with all these buds, this is going to be absolutely spectacular in another couple of days. Isn't it gorgeous? The one you're looking at right now with that beautiful light lavender flower, that is probably one of the most fragrant flowers that you'll ever find. Uh, that are not part of the David Austin roses. And that's Angel Face. And I know that I've had it before in my gardens and I just, I grow it just because it is so fragrant, it is so beautiful. Now this beautiful bright yellow one, yellows are, are always a little bit uh, more difficult to grow, I think, but this one is Julia Child. And I think it, look at how green the foliage is and how pretty the flowers are. And once again, these flowers are, are open when they do open all the way, perfect for pollinators. Isn't that lovely? That's so cool. Now this one here is a French rose, and it is Guy de Maupassant. And I'm not exactly sure what that translates into, but look at how pretty the flowers are. Now, since we've had rain, this one right here was open up yesterday, but with, we had about uh, half an inch of rain. And you can see that there's a little bit of browning with this, but still so pretty. This is one of the old roses. You can tell it's an old rose because of all the multiple petals that they have in there. So neat. Well, this one is pretty special. This is Queen Elizabeth. And I think it's really awesome how rose growers specifically breed a, a rose that they know that is going to be special. And, and they do it in honor of one special person. And this is Queen Elizabeth. This was actually introduced into commerce in um, 1954. Well, she was coronated in 52, 52 or 53. So I think it's just amazing that they have it out almost as soon as she was became the Queen of England, they went ahead and had a rose just for her. Well, this one right here is one of the oldest roses that came um, across from Europe. This is from France. This is Baron Prévost, and it came from 1842. Once again, that beautiful old rose. 
And I just sort of wanted to mention with these old roses, they, uh, they were very hardy. Uh, they were always very fragrant. And uh, I would imagine that they used the, uh, the, the, dried excuse me, the dried petals as potpourri to kind of sweeten the air in different people's houses and all that. But they were always this lovely, lovely white pink and they only bloomed in the springtime. When the English sailors started to explore the world and they went to China, they found roses like this bright one over here. This is a yellow one. And the yellows and the reds were actually from the China area. This was called easy going. What's neat about the, the yellow roses is that sometimes they bloomed a second time. And that's when we started going ahead and having roses that bloomed in the spring and then again later on in the year. So by having the old rose from Europe and the old roses from China and from Asia, we now have kind of intermixed the two of them. We've gotten so many more colors. We've gotten the oranges, we've gotten the bright reds, the reds and whites. They're just all these really cool things because we love roses. It's just such a cool thing. Um, also, you probably would notice that the Japanese beetles really like the yellow roses better than any other roses. Well, think about it. If they were originally from the China Japanese area, that's where the bugs were from. Now, I wanted to share one thing about this one with Queen Elizabeth. She has a small uh, leaf pattern right here that is bright, bright yellow. This is indicative of a type of disease or a virus. This is rose uh, mosaic virus. Now, you can go ahead and remove it if you want to, but this particular virus is not one that really does an awful lot of damage. You notice how it's only on this one area. It's not spreading anywhere else. So sometimes if you're a purist, you can go ahead and just prune it out or you can go ahead and leave it in. When you see something unusual though, it's really a good idea to look it up you know, check out the Rose Society, check out uh, different uh, fact sheets on roses to see what exactly is going on so that you can keep your roses as healthy as they should be. Let's go take out some more roses. Speaking of red roses, there's so many different reds. This one right here is Dark Desire, and it's considered a red. But it's more of a violet color to me. Isn't that gorgeous though? I also wanted to share something with you guys. Take a look down here at this foliage. It's kind of interesting looking. It, uh, this is actually cold damage. A uh, couple you know, weeks ago when we had, uh, we had warm weather and so the roses started growing really well, and then we had really cold temperature. So this is the type of cold damage that happens when the leaf is exposed to cold weather when it's very, very young and tender and the temperature is below 28. But if you look at these leaves on the same cane, notice how they're just fine. They're fully expanded, nice, rich color green. So real, real pretty. And there's another beautiful rose, almost ready to burst into bloom. Now this one's really cool. This to me is a real, real red. This is your piano. And uh, this, is, this was introduced in 1968, but this one is still shown as the perfect red rose because look at the color of that red. That is almost velvety red. It also is very floriferous. It has lots and lots of flowers. So you don't just have one bud like this. You have a whole bouquet, which is just it just makes it a lot easier for you to enjoy all the gorgeous roses. Really, really pretty. This one right here, let me show you. I think that this is the one I really like right there. See how it's got red on the outside, uh, excuse me, on the inside of the petals, but on the outside of the petals, it's white. This is love. And it actually looks its best when it's tightly closed. So when it opens and you can see all the anthers and all on inside, I think it's kind of pretty, but the rose people go, well, it's kind of past its prime. So, but, and we have another one that's really cool. Come on over here. This one is Double Delight. So it's the red and the white, kind of a creamy white. Isn't that pretty? And it turns out that the more red or the more white or the cream color here they have depends on how much sun it gets. This is one of my husband's favorite roses. Uh, this is called Graham Thomas. It's a David Austin rose. And the gold is just an exquisite color right there. And it doesn't smell like a rose, rose smell. It more smells like a bowl of wonderfully fragrant fruit, which I think is kind of cool. The neat thing about this rose is I, I like where it's been planted so that it can grow to what it is. If this is a very large, robust rose, notice how all the flowers are pointing in the same direction because they're all looking at the sun, which is kind of cool. The other neat thing about this rose is it doesn't have um, huge amount of staying power on the bush. So this would be like day one when the bud is just opening up, just opening with the promise of the color. 
This is day two, where the gold is spectacular. The deep, rich color and the fragrance is fabulous. This is day three, when it's open, it's fading out a little bit in the color, but still, with all those petals, it's so gorgeous. And this is day four, which needs to be pruned out. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do it properly. And we want to make sure that we have at least seven, five to seven leaf, leaflets. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I'm going to prune it right to there, seven leaflets. There we go. What I think is neat with these is you can just take the petals and let them fall to the ground and they make this beautiful mulch of petals. Wow, this, um, as you can see, I'm five foot. This is a very large rose. This is Sally Holmes. And she is what they call a single petal rose. And what I think is so cool about her is that when the buds first start out, you see this beautiful apricot color. It's just so pretty and delicate. And then when they grow up and open, the, the color is just a hint of color right at the outside of the edges. And when you look at the color right there where the anther is so bright yellow and the white and there's the littlest shade of apricot on the edges, this is so beautiful. Single petal rose, neat, neat, neat. This one also, um, has a limited life on their bush, but again, it's one thing that you should always take the time to enjoy. Now, there are some roses that, uh, well, there's some rose pests that are going to be out on the roses. Right now, we have the rose chafer, which is, again, from Asia. And um, what it does is just basically scrapes the roses and it damages the petals and that sort of thing. Uh, coming in June, a little bit further into June, we're going to have all those Japanese beetles. One thing about Japanese beetles, do not buy those Japanese beetle bags because what they'll do is they'll introduce beetles into your yard. If you don't have beetles in your yard, you don't want to have them. If you have beetles in your yard, you want to go ahead and take care of them in July. And that's a day, that's talk for another day, but just, just remember, don't get the beetle bags but enjoy these roses, they are so beautiful. Now, even though it's not July, this rose is called the 4th of July, and I just love the brightly red and the bright white. This looks like it's on fire with fireworks. It's just spectacular. So we have all these multicolors. And again, the plant breeders have really gone ahead and made some wonderful, wonderful creative roses like this, 4th of July. Now this is a climber, and you can see that it's very, very tall. It's also on a trellis. It has really nice, thick thorns, which is something you have to be careful of. Anytime you're working with roses, you have to be very aware of where the roses are and where the thorns are because they can really grab a hold of you. There is a disease called rose rosette, and none of these roses have it. But when you have rose rosette, you'll have, instead of this nice, dark, rich, uh, green color, the, the rose leaves are going to be kind of a red, burgundy red, and you'll have a whole bunch of the burgundy red. And they'll be what they call like a witch's broom. It'll almost be like a bouquet of leaves instead of all these wonderful leaves lying flat like this. And if you look at the, the thorns, these thorns right here are very dark and very pointed, and they're, they're widely spaced. And this is nature's way of saying, you know, don't eat me. Uh, but rose rosette will have, the whole cane will be covered with lots and lots and lots of bristly thorns and they'll actually be soft now soft to a, a thorn is is one of those things but this one is very hard and if you put your thumb into it you will actually go ahead and hurt yourself but the rose thorns on a rose that has rose rosette will be very soft you can actually push your hand into it and not get yourself hurt so that's one that you have to be aware of if you do have rose rosette just dig out the rose get rid of it and they know because it is a virus, it does not last in the soil. And you, you can replace the rose with a brand new rose that is clean. And just keep an eye on your roses and you'll enjoy them. This is Pierre de Ronsard. It's also called the Climbing Eden Rose. And as you see, look at the stem. I mean, this is really a very sturdy stem. This is made for go, growing up very, very straight and tall and climbing. The, um, the owner of this rose has had to cut it back because it grew so large and so fast, it actually covered the window that it was in front of. And some people were saying, we have a window to look outside. We need to go ahead and be able to see outside. That didn't hurt the rose at all because it's completely covered with beautiful, beautiful flowers. I do want to point out again how gorgeous these flowers are, this beautiful old rose with all the beautiful petals. Um, if you look on the very, very back, see, notice how these petals right here a little bit of browning on that. That is because we had a rainstorm. 
and the rain will go ahead and have like uh, different diseases, uh, botrytis and that sort of thing. It, it just, it can be glued off if you want to, to make it look absolutely perfect. And if you're going to show this in a rose show, you'd have to do that. One more, and there we go. Isn't that gorgeous? Climbing. Now this one is not one of the old roses and it's not a single petal rose. This one was designed to be in rose shows. This is the queen rose. This is absolutely beautiful. This is Liebesaber, it's a German name. Um, when you're looking at roses for a rose show, they have to have a very high crown. So notice how the center right here is very, very tall. The petals on the outside are almost horizontal. You're going to have some black marks here and black marks here. You want to leave those because that's characteristic of this particular breed of rose. And take a look how it sort of swirls around. So that is the mystery and the romance of this rose as it matures and it swirls open and just reveals a little bit hints of its mysterious beauty. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the roses. This, this place is just wonderful with all the different fragrances and the different colors and textures of the roses. I've had fun. I hope you have had fun too. Thank you for joining me right here on Delmarva Gardens on Pack 14.